Welcome back to the Cross Border Interview Podcast. Today's guest is Calgary's mayoral candidate, Teddy Umbanya. Um, hopefully I pronounced his name correctly here, but Teddy, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. Pleasure to be here, Chris. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, so Teddy, uh, I, I got to start with the same question I ask all the candidates, all my guests. Where does your sense of duty to serve come from? My sense of duty to serve... Uh... It has come from how I was raised from family. And uh, and as a man of faith, uh, we always attribute everything to the supremacy, the God Almighty. So, um, uh, you know, I, I'm a Christian. So uh, we, we we attribute our strength and uh, passion for everything and uh, love and care, you know, to God, you know. but. You have to manifest that as, as as an individual. So, but my passion to serve has always been from 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 my family. Um, and that would be the answer. Serving can come in many fashions, whether it through be nonprofits, whether it be through politics, whether it be through any avenue that you choose. But you have chosen to give back in and serve the people of Calgary politically. You have denounced your decision to run for the uh, mayor mayor of Calgary. Um, I, I, before we get into your run, I've got to ask about your upbringing. Were your family political? Does pol politics run in your family? Why choose politics to get involved and give back that way? It, uh, uh, great question, Chris. Um, I'm, I will take you back to the first question as well as passion to serve. And of course, from family, I did I did a, a whole lot of not for profit. Um, consulting uh, as a development consultant for over 20 something years still doing it and um, it's kind of slowed down um, because of the pandemic uh, which of course you know is uh, globally politicized so um, in my own opinion um, it slowed everything down um, I, I'm a development consultant uh, I have worked with uh, served with uh, um, a lot of multilateral organizations well, all the way from the World Bank uh, UNDP British Council go to Institute UNDP and the United Nations uh, being in Manhattan, being in world, uh, you know, the, um, G, uh, the General Assembly of World Leaders have organized side events just across the UN one there, Man um, the UN one hotel to, to discuss on policy issues that affect young people all over the world. So my passion to serve uh, has been from, from as a kid, I've always loved to make a difference in communities. I've always asked questions that shouldn't be asked in even very hostile cultures where you don't speak up. I've always spoken up my mind, and that I've shown in my growth over the years as a young person, as a as a as an activist, as an activist, as a student leader. You know, uh, I grew up that way. I was. Uh, I, I, I'm pretty sure you have read my profile. I, I used to be grew to become a vice chair of Human Rights Information Network in West Africa through the British Council, where I discussed with a lot of ministers of states and countries on issues affecting a lot of young folks and access to justice and child rights and in so many other stuff in, in terms of development in all ramifications of it. I spoke my mind. I researched on these issues, even on IT. I'm, I'm not an IT expert. I've spoken at the University of Western Cape. I was invited, prepared, spoke on open source softwares. I was against really proprietary softwares in as much as it's for the 1%. I spoke highly on open open source softwares to share knowledge for humanity. So my passion to serve uh, come from a long way. And uh, my, my decision to run for mayor of Calgary um, basically is because I have been, I've had a lot of experience in life. I have been, uh, people don't know this. I used to be on the street. I, I, I left home to know what the world was all about. I've been in the oil and gas sector. I've worked with multilateral organization governments. I have been with around politicians behind the scenes at the top level. Um, in, in this world and uh, the global systems, I'm privileged to travel around the world. Um, so I, I've had this experience. Having watched Calgary since I moved here from 2008, uh, I moved from Toronto to Calgary 2008. And then uh, we had a 2010, we had an election that brought in the current mayor. I've been very um, diligently, passionately following the city politics. Uh, and I do go there every combined council meeting, every month, every first Monday of the month. I've been going there since 2008 to, uh, to just two years ago, prior to all these whole pandemic things starting, all this whole drama, I've been going to observe things myself. 
So I have seen the city of Calgary grow from a more conservative physical um, environment to a more neoliberal um, um, atmosphere and environment. And uh, that was troubling to me. And I felt, and I said, okay, um, over here, I think historically we, we are pretty much, uh, I always use the word Republicans. We are progressive Republicans in nature in this province and in this city. And uh, we are giving, so many conservatives are giving that space, that they are creating the space for neoliberals to begin to decide the future of the future of this great city or even the entire province for us. So, and I said that we've got to be speaking out. And, uh, you know, I, I started my political activity here in, in, in this province. I joined the then the progressive conservatives when I moved here. I was attending the meetings in my riding. Of course, you know, that's where it starts. Um, I know because of my experience in politics, I just Google note, check out my postal code, know where my writings are, my MLA, my Edaman, my province, my members of parliament. I happened to connect with them. And then I started going for meetings. And then I got on, elected on the board in Calgary, my call. So I was there. And then I you know, went for all the AGM meetings we used to have in Red Deer. And then I quietly and uh, come back. I was observing all these things uh, over time. So my decision to run is because of things I think is going wrong. I strongly believe that the path this city is, go is going is not gonna be sustainable with the current city council and mayor that we have. I believe they, they have a way to spend this city. And from what I have heard, those steps campaigning and based on my research and based on what I'm, I've been listen you know, listening to Calgarians, um, they don't like it. Well, and that's the good jumping off point because Elections are about hearing from the people, hearing from the people who you are going to be elected from. So what are you hearing from the people of Calgary? You've talked about how you believe that this uh, council is going to a more neoliberal and you wanted to bring it back to a more progressive republic. How, are you hearing that from Calgarians from all across the city or in certain parts of the city? Because I, I don't think I need to tell you, but Calgary is a unique place. What issues are affecting the people in the Northeast might not be affected in the Southwest. So what are you hearing from all Calgarians? Because that is who you'll be representing is all Calgarians. So what are you hearing? What I'm hearing is that they do not like the way the, the, the city is, uh, is expanding. We are, we, are, we, are, we are sprawling out of control. Um, the expenses is getting out of control. Um, city council and the mayor, they are, they are earning way too much in salaries and pensions and all that. Uh, and, and the argument um, we both, and I agree with all the people I'm talking to of different race and religion and, and, and ethnicity, I mean, gender, uh, they, do, they do agree with me that the current economic climate that we have is not the same as it was 20, 30 years ago during the oil boom. So it is time for change. It is time for us to reevaluate all these things that we are earning as, as elected officials. Um, top city managers, some of them are earning more than the mayor. Um, so so it's, it's not going to be feasible. I mean, it's not, it's, it's not right. Let's put it that way. So we need to change stuff from there to start from the city as, 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 a, as a corporation. And we are all stakeholders to it. We should begin from there to reassess and tighten our belt and, and cut off excesses and contingencies that we don't need. So what I'm hearing, people are not happy with the taxes. Um, taxes in this city, if you have, if you have made, yeah, yeah, you know, I'm pretty sure you're aware about that, have doubled. So most homeowners and businesses, um, some have closed them. And you know what, Chris, this is not because of pandemic. It's been, it was going on before the pandemic, but you know, politicians are blaming every damn thing, excuse my language, on this pandemic. So like they do no wrong. Everything is COVID, you know. And as far as I am personally, in my own engagement with the community, it is BS. We need to call things out. Uh, I'm not running based on my party platform. I'm a proud progressive conservative, and I'm the only one. Some of them are conservative. They don't want to put up there because some of us are not happy campers now with the Jason Kenney government. I am one of them. I'm not happy camper, but I voice my opinion out. Uh, and, and if there is a way to change leadership, I'm t I, t I say it out loud to even friends who don't want to hear it, I will move that motion to nominate and change Jason Kenney. I believe he's gone liberal. I believe he's not true conservative guy that I supported to become the leader of this party. So uh, politically, it has consequences for us. 
but I don't, I don't want to see NDP be in charge of this prov provincial government in the next two years. I want to get the conservatives back. But for that to happen, we need to voice out, we need to change uh, uh, you know, our premier, Jason Kenney, to get another leader that will run the next election for now. Politically, an answer. So coming back to what is going on here in Calgary, it has affected so many things. You know, people, businesses, homeowners, commercial residential, everything is not going the way it should do. And the root cause of these things, hike in taxes. Our taxes have gone way through the roof. Ask anyone, I heard about it on the doorstep, I researched about it, and that's what is going on. Um, whatever excuse they want to give, if you hike up taxes, you're going to lose businesses. We, we don't like taxes, too much taxes over here. We don't like government to tell us really get into our business, uh, to tell us what to do. And so we need to get back to the basics of conservative values on how to run a city. Well, one of the priorities that, and this is on your website, so I'm not, I'm not quoting anything you don't know, is you Correct. want to lower taxes. So this is something Correct. that I think everyone agrees that we should be doing. So you, on your on your website, uh, on your visions part, which will be linked on the, in the show notes, you say lower taxes, homeowners and businesses taxes, 10% fixed rate for four years. So a four-year tax rate on your houses and your business for 10, four years. Is that sustainable? Because inflation does happen. I think you will agree things do go up. So prices will have to go up. So what in the budget right now, because I'm assuming you've looked at the budget for someone who pays attention to politics, what in the budget besides salaries needs to be looked at and potentially cut to ensure that we can keep that sustainable 10% tax rate for four years? First of all, Chris, uh, before, before we made that decision, I proposed that to my team. I made a big, huge research. I asked a lot of economics experts. I'm not, you know, to be a leader, you don't need to know everything. I don't tend to pretend to know everything, but you have yeah. to get the right, the facts to make your decisions and be consistent on that. So I have been consistent on this message uh, because I believe it's workable. I believe council, when they see the facts, they, they will vote on it. And, and uh, I believe it's going to trickle down based on what I've heard from experts is possible and it could trickle down the economy and it's got booming and we'll start hiring again. Small business will start expanding. Downtown occupancy rate will start going, going back up again and all that. So it has tremendous significant, significant impact on, in the economy to boost the economy. So apart from the salaries and all that, uh, we intend to cut. And I'm being very blunt about it. I'm, I'm not sugarcoating anything for Calgarians. I want them to see me at the way I am. And th these are the platforms that I have. That's what I'm going to pursue in my agenda in council. So um, I'm going to freeze hiring. And that's what we intend to do. I'll freeze hiring for two good years. F freezing hiring, we're going to save a whole lot from the city. The city of Calgary, despite what is going on, they're trying to mitigate some shortfalls there and there. It's all politics. And then they begin to cut 15 or 10 percent from the workforce. It's all politics. If you've been to the city of Calgary or researched about the city of Calgary workforce and know what is going on in the city of Calgary and the contractors that they have, you would understand the local interest. Let me put it that way. That is behind the scenes and driving all these issues, and that that has made so many things. First of all, we are talking. We, we don't have budget. We don't have any money here at the city of Calgary. They have bankrupted this city, so we have we have no budget at all so you know we, we got to cut down on things and that would affect uh, the policing because they are city employees so two years out of freeze hiring i strongly believe in smart policing i have asked a police chief this prior before in the what i used to do in the past and i asked chief if we hypothetically we hire one million police officers in this boots on the ground is it going to stop any crime or addiction or the answer was no nope. One single answer, and he was staring into my eyes, I was staring into his eyes, I said, thank you, chief. That was the end of the discussion. I needed to get that answer from him. So it's not about how many boots on the ground that's gonna stop crime or prevent. We're gonna export the blues 120%. We're gonna provide them all the resources and capacities that they need. I've been in touch, I've talked to some of them who are, you know, there is in the police department, the tactical unit, yep. you know, these guys come out when, you know, let me put it that way, when the, the occasion is really very high and they come out, do their job and they get out. So uh, I want to see more of a smart policing that way and, and not more of, we are not living in a, we are not living in a police society. And this is what I'm hearing on a doorstep. 
where most people here, and this is not just the immigrant communities, I've, I've been campaigning in the white neighborhoods, and they, they, they appreciate the police, but they don't want police stopping them, you know, or um, sitting in a car in their neighborhood, you know, having this radar thing consistently. People don't like that anymore, you know. People are respecting rules, and at least overall citizens here are respecting most traffic laws and abiding by AHS guidelines. We, we need to relax and, uh, and, and move on with the pace, you know, and, and not following all these new liberal ideas on how to revitalize and change it. What are you changing? Kagri, I'm glad you said this is unique. It has always been unique before I got come in here as an immigrant that got assimilated. I love this city, passionately like you do. So I, I, I'm a citizen, and I want to see this city as it is. I, I, I'm very open, I'm very pragmatic to change things that we need to change based on if Kagarians need those things. But Kagri is a unique, classic city. It's a world-class city, and we need to keep it as it is. Um, all this revitalization and all that and all that, to be honest with you, I'm not a fan of that. You know, we got to keep Kagri as it is and revitalize when and where necessary. We do that. So just on that note, because there's a lot to unpack with what you just said, on that note, revitalization, because the downtown core, like you've said in the past statements, it has been decimated. There is a high vacancy rate downtown and the lack of the, the high vacancy rate has caused the residential communities in uh, Calgary to see higher taxes. So how do you envision retention and re reattraction of businesses to the downtown core? Because you know, as best as I do, Calgary is not alone in this situation. It is a situation that is affecting Saskatoon, Edmonton, Regina, Toronto, Montreal, Vancouver. All big cities are having issues with vacancy right now because businesses are picking up and leaving. How do you cut tape at City Hall to ensure that we are a more vibrant and more engaging community to have those businesses come back, but also new businesses set up shop in the downtown core? I do believe, first of all, that we need to have trust and legitimacy with elected officials. Kagerians want to, first of all, see someone that is honest and transparent and have an open government and not doing this behind the closed doors, and which we have seen. Because I do believe that the current council have been softened into with local actors, you know, into closed door meetings, so which is not becoming, which is not transparent anymore. It's not, they're no more accountable to Kagerians, to citizens here. They are now accountable to the, to the special interest groups that that's driving the agenda the city hall and that's how politics works and um, of course i know this i have the skin but to to get into those negotiations and bargaining but it's going to be an open government if you want to be a lobbyist to be a, influence the agenda the city hall for some interest that you have then it's going to be public we got to make it public i want kagarian to see those huge lobbies look i'm not going to drive them away and um, it's part of democracy but we want to see all of them there's no point in you know, closed door meeting deals. If you want to be, if you want to, because there is legal. So what, if it's legal, then what's the problem? Then Listian M there is going to be televised. I want Kagarians to see who is there influencing those agendas. And that's one of the reasons. So I, I, I'm pretty sure you are aware uh, about the um, the Kagari, uh, the, um, the, uh, the regional economic uh, outlook for 2019, 2024 report that city of Calgary released. That was last May, I, I, I think. And the report points to so many reasons for optimism in the next you know, five years and around. Um, of course, they looked at growth in the energy sector. They, they looked at increased investments in areas like infrastructure and real estate. Uh, I, I do recall they talked about sustained job creation, population growth, and then, then migration. Uh, which, of course, they think expected to help the economic region to improve, you know, through all this 2014. And frankly, Chris, I, I do agree to certain things the reports uh, have put it, and um, some I have concerns um, on. Um, but overall, um, I do agree there's optimism in the air, but it, does, it just cannot come from the city of Calgary. We've we got to have a paradigm shift in the way we do business. But my, my argument is that it's not going to be business as usual. If we want to build that confidence and trust in the city of Calgary, the way we do things, we have to engage citizens. They elected us into this, uh, they elected, you know, elected officials into the city hall. We have to engage them. If, you, if you've been around municipal politics, I mean, I did my internship in the city of Toronto, the biggest city in this Calgary. I've seen what politicians do there, you know, in trying to, sometimes they try to skip engaging their constituencies on very hot topics. So they try to fast forward the whole thing um, so that people don't really get to participate. 
and that is not democracy for me. So um, I, I intend to support all these areas. I intend to provide tax credits. And as you know very well, funding here on huge capital projects is not a municipal thing. You got to create that multi-level partnerships. You got to form with respectful tone and negotiations with the provincial government, whoever is in government, and I, I hope it's going to be, you know, the conservative to be back in government again, or, and the federal government as well. So that, that you have to say that tone. Um, you must not dictate the tone as, as, a, as, a, as a mayor. You get the experts, independent, who are nonpartisan, that have the interest that love this city to, to lead and provide the, you know, the, 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 the structures. By the way, to, just, a, just a, a little bit um, to track back here. Um, you know that there are some programs and uh, structures in municipal government that is a little is quite restricted just to the few uh, it's, it's just uh, if you understand what i mean it's, it's just for the few yeah so that is what i'm talking about open government we need to open up the government and build trust and confidence in the system especially in the municipal level so you know task providing reducing those taxes providing tax credits incentives for financial and economic incentives we've got to move out of the box forming partnership public private partnerships talking to provincial government and federal government on those areas that we need to invest in, and then to support local businesses here, attract investments in the... Calgary is becoming globally... I mean, if you look at the report from the Calgary, downtown, the Calgary Economic Development Report that they just released, you would see attractions of high-tech companies coming into Calgary and all that. So, um, you know, to, to, let, to, to respond categorically to, to your question, um, I'm in support of development that is transparent and accountable to Calgarians and not just a few. So there's a few things yet again I want to unpack there as well. But engagement is number one. Um, I talk to my neighbors and I think everyone talks to their neighbors socially distance as, as we can until we all get the vaccine and we can get back to talking to each other close to close, uh, face to face. Um, but you talk to my neighbors and they say engagement is key to the next council. Um, but too much engagement is sometimes a downfall. One of the areas that my neighbors, and I think I would be talking correctly if I said I agree with this as well, but we elected council members and the mayor to represent our views. We do not want council members and the mayor to come back and say, we are holding a publicide, a vote of a citywide vote on certain issues because that costs money. And I think you will admit that we don't have money, so we cannot be doing that. How, how do we engage people properly, but ensure that we're getting the information we need? Because you can go out and talk to everyone until you're blue in the face. You're going to hear 900 different things from 900 different people because everyone has their own opinion. So how do you make the best decision for Calgary when you have so many people coming to you with different opinions on how that is to move forward? So engagement have got different um, levels in, in politics. And... Uh... The engagement I'm looking forward to seeing is not about the public side. Of course, you know, I'm, I'm against spending, and of course, I'm going to do a lot of cuts as the next mayor of this city. So public side is more like a last resort, uh, where we just there's no, there's no headway in council on that, those huge issues that probably citizens may want to go for that public side. And, and so we are living in an area of um, technology. And uh, to, yeah, I, you and I, we're engaging each other right now, you know, because of this whole pandemic, before I pro probably I'm just gonna be in your office and then we chat one-on-one, -on -one, right? So most things are now being done online. You're in the office, you have your device, you log on, you make your vote or whatever. So, but uh, engaging your other man, and for, I don't really like wanna call them other man, I mean, we need to change to begin to recognize the other agenda. So in, engaging your, you know, city councillor, you know, is the most important thing. Sending an email to them, whether they, sometimes they, for city councillors don't respond, they respond to what they think is, is, is of interest to them, you know, but that's why we are citizens. We, we need to specifically get engaged on issues that matters to you in your constituency. If there are things that are, that's happening and you people don't like it, or there's a development that is going on, which of course the city council, I mean, the city of Calgary is doing right now. Most times they have that on, on the web. That there's a development going on here, they want to hear you say. So you're beginning to see new frontiers in, in using data to begin to uh, work, you know, uh, structured municipal gov governance. So, and that's what 
that's what I'm looking to have that more efficiently done, uh, you know, in the in my administration. So that's my that's my perception about engagement. It's not about going through public side. No, so understandable. Engage, exactly. Um, you have mentioned this, and I think every Calgarian is feeling the effects of the global pandemic, but also Calgary was hit with the oil and gas price downturn. We we are literally living through two pandemics, the oil and gas industry getting collapsed, vacancies moving out, uh, businesses moving out of Calgary because there's just no work for them, uh, but also the global pandemic. Let's talk about recovery. If you are the successful candidate on October 18th, you will have to deal with two recoveries of the city, the global pandemic and the oil and gas industry. How do you ensure that the recovery is felt by all and not just the one percent? Great question, Chris. Uh, <laughs> I'll tell you what. My campaign and and has been about the ninety nine percent. To be honest with you, I've been around the one percent in my in in my life a lot. I have seen behind the scenes, and nothing moves me. I've, I've been most of the trips have gone around the whole world. Even first time I came to this great country in two thousand and four to speak at the University of Toronto on why do you for World Youth Pilot Project as a curriculum consultant and keynote speaker. It, it was all prepared. All my trips to Asia, Latin America, India, Europe, back Africa, back and forth, Europe, is all prepared. That's what you enjoy when you are in the not-for-profit, you know, at that high level of development. You know, you get prepaid trips, flown business class, first class sometimes. You chat with people with the 1%. You go to Davos on side events as a not-for-profit. So you've been around world leader. So I, I'm sick and tired of the 1%. Uh, but we still need the 1%. It's like talking about capitalism. We still need that to drive, but we have to find the balance. We don't want, we don't want them ripping off or leaving anyone behind. We have to find a balance to, for sustainable development, which has to come in you know, getting people, getting everyone together and not leaving anyone behind. So the campaign is for the 99%. I strongly believe that this city, the next election is not gonna be defined by the money politics, all the city councillors here, I have done personal research on each and every one of them. They're all behind, except two of them that I, I have I've not seen them too, but they are pretty much like me. They don't have big money, you know, uh, back, you know, uh, businessmen behind them or developers. The rest have been funded. And at the end of the June, I'm going to publish our, our bank account. Uh, how much we have and donations we have done some things some of the flyers we have some people printed it for us as for the graphics they run the flyers for us so we're going to print that out transparent to at the end of the june i'll put up the bank account i'll just we we'll just screenshot it post it on our social media so that people see how much we have in our bank account and you know the optimism and confidence i have this election i've been talking to people and for uh, i'm glad you made uh, debbie she heard about me we have known each other for a very long for some time when she was used to be back working in the city before she went up north and my campaign manager used to be a tenant of mine in my previous job they all heard about what i'm doing and they're all volunteering my campaign website is designed by someone i don't even know i make me based on my vision what are you what do you want me to do for you teddy i said i don't need your money okay can i design I, I, we design websites i can i said, sure why not that's what i'm looking for my website was designed, she paid for the hosting, designed it, her name is under that place, Lauren Reichman. So I'm just letting you know that everything I have, the campaign office we have in downtown is my, is my campaign manager's business space. You know, I'm the one pretty much even, you know, keeping her here in Calgary. They want, she wanna move away from the city because the business is not moving, you know. So she's pro, they're providing resources, volunteering their time. So the strength of the campaign is Calgarians. The people dropping flyers I don't know, calling, we are dropping flyers for them. These are Calgarians I don't know that believes in what I'm saying. And saying, Ted, I hope your message is gonna be heard. This is real, I hope you don't change. I say, trust me, that's my word. I will not change when I get into office. Teddy is Teddy and I've always been Teddy for the past, for the past, uh, uh, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm now 51. So I will probably say for the past 40 years. So, uh, you know, I, the, the, going forward, um, the campaign is for the 99%, not the 1%. And as I said before, in, in our conversation, if the big money politics, we're not gonna drive them and we wanna be part of or continue to shape the agenda. It's not gonna be business as usual. I will make it open public 
for them to have a lobbyist registry at the city of Calgary, where everyone knows that, oh, Johnson & Johnson is here lobbying for this, or uh, MMAX is uh, doing this and that, you know, their name listed. This televised, the bidding process is televised. It's an open government. Calgarians that want to watch, watch that online. They don't need to be coming to the gallery. So that's the way we want to see open government. And we are doing this for the city, for the future of this generation. And that is one of the reasons why I am the only candidate in this election that has the young people, the millennials, the Gen Zs in my core vision. Because I'm trying, I'm going to institute a shadow youth cabinet. And the reason is because of my experience in politics where Politicians don't use the young people. Most of the young folks doing flyers for me at the end, they drop them off. They don't care. No, they, they won't even say thank you or get back to them. That, I want these young folks in this city to realize that the city, they are the foundation and the future of this great city, both in high schools, in university, college, and entrepreneurs. Even out, you know, out of school, but they are young. They, they, let them come in, participate in that shadow cabinet, be part of the, be part of the decision-making process. Before council votes on it, of course, you know, there are commissions and committees that make presentations in council on anything at all. We want them to be part of those, those, those things. And their own committee is the shadow cabinet. Well, before we get into the last set of questions here, I do want to talk about youth because you, like you've just eloquently stated, youth is one of the big things that we need to ensure stays within Calgary because uh, if they leave, go to school because we have great schools here ourselves, but sometimes they want to go to Toronto, go to Vancouver, they will leave. How do we retain the youth? Because if we do not have a budding youth uh, population, our population is going to dwindle. It's going to start shrinking and our tax base will start shrinking and there's a lot of issues that could affect Calgary if we don't have the youth here. So while youth can't vote, you need the voice there and that shadow cabinet like you were just talking about is a good idea. How do you and what have you heard ensure or see as the role of youth in a first year, first term of your mayoralship? The, the role of the youth is going to be very great. Um, it will be historic because they would have a voice at the city hall, first of all. They will have a voice. I, 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 of course, you know this, I'm, I'm a development consultant and my expertise on youth development and empowerment. Uh, we, I've always loved to set up the guidelines and um, what I have done in the past, continue to do for young folks. But the, the be, if you want to have productive meetings and conversations with young people, even in your family with your children or whatever, the, you need to let them do their own thing. You got to set them the guidelines, give them space. That's when you get things more productive. But if you begin to be right there and then, you know, show that and uh, nothing is going to work, you know, they, 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 they will just, just shy away from that. So we got to give them the freedom for them to be there, do their own thing. We set the guidelines and let them speak up. So they're going to have a strong voice, a voice that's going to be more sustainable as regards to plans in all applications of development for the city of Calgary they would have a strong voice. One of the things uh, we are looking into keep, to keep them here, and that's what I've heard from Dostal, from a lot of young folks when I was in the university, I've been talking about this prior to, to my announcement of my intent to run October last year. One of the things they wanna see is a more vibrant city. A lot of young folks, you know, you and I may be in a different generation, but the younger generations are always thinking, having to, look, they're gonna have fun, they wanna have fun. They want to they have fun. You know, you're beginning to see a lot of skateboarding, you know, um, sports in downtown and all over the city. And some little parks, you know, you're beginning to see basketball, park, you begin to see a few other things coming up. And some are even telling me, hey, you got to create a, an Olympic pool for us. You know, they all have their own different things. But the most important thing is to make sure that the economy booms. We attract the right investments here. After graduation, most of them are getting the job here through practicum and all that. We talk to businesses to keep them here for them in employment and then invest in arts and culture in this city is very important and where the arts and the investments i'm talking about is not the investment of for instance uh, you have got a three-dimensional artworks the blue the purple ring or whatever you call it i hate to see that thing over there when i drive to the airport or you are going through the olympic way all those artworks that what we spent close to a million dollars or half a million dollars and by the way they were done by foreign artists foreign artists. Does that mean I've been around this city, knocking around, moving around and, and you know, just doing my own thing out and about. And I've seen local artists, creative designs, you know, morals and from local students here in this great city. 
So we can challenge, if we want to do anything on arts and culture, we can challenge these young folks. And if we're going to spend, for instance, let's say 100 grand on something, those young folks will get a better concept that will reflect the values and symbols of this province and this city, better than bringing a foreign artist. So I, I'm, I'm just against supporting local. I mean, I'm just against foreign artists coming here or engineers or something. Does that mean Canadians don't have engineers or architects? Does that mean we have the best of engineers in, in last I checked, the best of architects, the best of artists in this in, in this world? In fact, we, we have, those people are trying to write that off. The oil and gas sector, we still have the best oil and gas in all ramifications of asset, environmental assessment, you may want to look into it in the world. So we, we supporting local is at the heart of this campaign. Support, supporting local artists, using these young folks to create great concepts and designs. For whatever we need in this city, we can get it in this category that's moving away. And so that's, so investment in arts and culture, science, technology, innovations, challenging them to think out of the box on how to grow this city forward is gonna keep them here. And that's what I've heard from a lot of young folks. Few I know that have moved and got a job, we, we went to school together. You know, they are in their you know, early 20s. They are now in Toronto. And I walked them, hey, you got to come back, you know. And then we just have a few conversations. And I wanted to know the reasons why they moved. One, they wanted a more vibrant city, you know, where they're easy to access. There are so much competition, you know. But we still have to have this conversation going on. The population density, you know, is different here, the way it is in Toronto or Vancouver. And that should be made known to most of people. But we are living in a classic city, vibrant city, where we've got to make it more vibrant you know, for these young people to stay here. You, last last area I want to touch on before we do wrap up here, infrastructure. Infrastructure, infrastructure, infrastructure. Um, we have two major projects on city council's desk, which is trying to move forward. You openly have admitted that, well, you've stated that Calgary's broke. We have the Green Line and the stadium, the downtown stadium for the Stampede Ground slash the Calgary Flames. Do we need to revisit these two infrastructure projects moving forward in a next year, next term? Because if we do not have the money, we should not be building things. If I'm, I would not be mistaken to say that. And, but these two projects are needed according to this council. What is your opinion on the Green Line, but also the downtown arena slash stadium? I'll start with the Green Line. Um, uh, great question, Chris. Uh, I'm not a fan of the Green Line for so many reasons. I'm not against the Green Line, but I'm not a fan of it. I'm not a fan in the sense that it's a multi-year project that we don't know when it's going to start, end. It could be 10, 15, 20 years. It's going to create jobs for, for sure. But Behind the scenes in that in, in this whole thing, and I'm glad that the Kenny's government is withholding that fund. Behind the scenes, there are so many local interests and international interests behind the scene. Sometimes from from and people may not realize this. And I've done things in the development world, so I can tell you categorically that most invest, investments you see here in Vancouver, Calgary, Toronto, they have come from certain foreign nationals. Um, uh, you and I know what's going on right now with, with China and, and the way they are trying to spread to, to the communist regime to spread to conquer the whole world economy. Uh, uh, I tell you, we are feeling it here. And it's done so silently that you and I may not see. It. Behind the scenes, so I do not want to see foreign companies, like communist China, taking over investments in this city. It's happened in some areas in this Canada. We don't want to see it here. We gotta, we gotta stand against such things. It is not, it is not sustainable. Um, it's not in the interest of Calgarians, and we have to speak up. We don't want that. So we want local investors, Calgarians, Canadians, to invest here. So my reason for not supporting the Green Line One is because it's a multi-year project that's not gonna provide immediate access to Calgarians. Not the one percent. The one percent is got it all. So for the ninety-nine percent, it's not gonna provide access to senior citizens. Who I have talked to, some of them are waiting, uh, you know, waiting from the, their home, 45 minutes, one hour, summertime for access handballs to come pick them up. You know, we got to provide, expand on those access for senior citizens. We got to expand on the BRT, which I have seen from what I'm listening and seeing in this city. People are, people want to hop on that BRT, the 
the, 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 the rapid transit program that we have, the buses, they want to get on quick. So we need more of that. So it's going to create more jobs, hire more drivers. We, 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 we expand on that. And some part of the money, I want to put it in, into a shovel-ready approach right here in the city with Calgarians deciding how we can go shovel-ready approach in creating jobs. So that's one for the green line. For, for, the, for, the, stadium. for, the, for the stadium, you know that the deal has already been, legally it's been signed, concealed. Yeah. So, and we don't want to lose flames. It's, this, it's part of the social fabric. Whether you're a Flames fan or not, I'm a Flames fan. Um, at the moment, not happy, not a happy camper because we didn't do well. I, I said it on my Twitter, watching the first two conservative losing, losing. I said, look, we don't need this coach. It, it doesn't matter. If you're a coach and you're losing, losing strengths, come on. It's business. You got to get fired. Just go. Bring in a new guy. Even his assistant could be coming and turn things around. It happened in Raptors. Raptors did the same thing in Toronto. So we, yeah. it's not about the name, the, how long you've been in service or how long you have worked in a company. It does not matter. It's about delivering. You have to deliver for citizens. We, we want to win. So uh, we got to keep find a way to keep flames here. That's mine. They, 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 they attract and, and, you know, a lot of stock investments. They, they generate a lot of revenues for the city as well. That deal, I wasn't happy with it the way the current council did that deal. It was very closed door meeting. And that deal, in my own opinion, was more in the interest of the owners than the city of Calgary. So which was not fair, in my own opinion. So we've got to find a way. And to be honest with you, it's not, I'm not going to bring up in my agenda. If they bring it up, then we, that's going to be a huge conversation to have to see ways and where we could reassess or reevaluate on issues to make sure we save some money for the city of Calgary if they want to go that path. And, and that's my position. Perfect. Um, Teddy, I want to quickly ask you one question. And this is my favorite question of the interview because this is the moment when I give you two minutes. Uh, I'm going to time you and I'll, go, I'll give you two minutes here. But the question is, why should you be the next mayor of the great city of Calgary? Whenever you're ready, go ahead. Uh, I believe I, I would be the next mayor of this city because I'm honest. I'm genuine. I, I say things. I have the experience in life. I could be diplomatic when, I, when it needs to be. I am, I'm a very blunt, a straight shooter. Uh, I, I intend to engage Calgarians in the things that we do. It's not for the 1%. This city is for the 99%. It's going to be, it's not going to be business as usual. And I am different. I am different from all of them running for this candidate in as much because Calgarians are supporting me. It's not based on my social media views. It's based on, you know, the engagements I have been getting and all that appointments every day since I declared my intent. People, you know, saw my first video and all that and emailing me and all that. So I'm different from all of them in terms of the ideas that I have. All the ideas I have on, my, on the platform, they're, they're all for sustainable reasons. We want this city to have a sustainable path. And that's, what, that's the difference between me and all these guys I'm offering. And of course, my ideas in terms of taxes, they are different. My ideas in terms of trying to get the young people involved, they are different. So my ideas in trying to make sure that we engage Calgarians, they are different. So I'm quite different in my platform. I'm different in my political ideology. We want to keep things, and I would not want to see the neoliberals deciding for us in the next election. That's why I believe I would be the next mayor of this guy. will come October 18, 2021. Perfect. But before that, you need to campaign, you need to go canvas, you need door knockers. How can people get involved in your campaign? Well, people have been reaching us through our social media and through DM, the, 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 um, through the website, www.teddyfigure4cargary.ca. Um, my LinkedIn is there. Um, put my name up, uh, Teddy Obona. LinkedIn is it's come up. Twitter, my handle is tweet at tweet menu. Um, the type my name is up there. And then um, feel free, leave a call. We we'll get back. To, we have a lot of calls, messages I need to get back to. And then uh, I've got an amazing team, my communications director that is here, Debbie. You know, they are sleepless night. I mean, I was up with her talking oh, mid till midnight last night on where she wants me to go today and tomorrow and the weekend. And then the campaign manager who have decided to remain behind the scenes, Deep, Deep and uh, Coffee. They are doing an amazing job and all the volunteers in different worlds that we've been focal points that we have. 
So people want to get involved in the 99% campaign, reach out to the campaign, feel free, speak your mind. We, we, are, we, are, we value freedom of speech. It's not what is going on in Ottawa. We value freedom of speech. I take nothing personal, but I'll let you know my position. What I'm telling you right now, Chris, is what I'm telling anyone I have met. It does not matter your gender, your faith, your, your, your community. What I tell you is what I tell each and everyone. And I do believe that Kagerians deserve honesty, deserve a politician and a mayor that's going to look into their eyes and tell them straight out yes or no, or where the person stands without shifting grounds. Perfect. Well, Teddy, um, for the sh listeners and for the viewers, uh, the links to Teddy's website, Facebook page, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn will be in the show notes. I would recommend that you get out and uh, check it out, get involved in this campaign. The future of Calgary depends on it. So get involved, take action, volunteer for any campaign that you believe in. Uh, Teddy, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. You bet.